Those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. But as what's new always best, we learn by reflecting on old mistakes, but retracing our steps also reveals hard-won wisdom from previous generations. Hi everyone, if it's your first time to the channel, my name is Jack Wang. On this channel, we talk about science, teaching and how skills you learn through these processes can help you in any career. I was recently invited to give an international conference talk in Taiwan that's super exciting and the topic they've asked me to speak on is a really ambitious one. The last 10 years of teaching in Australian universities. When I first heard about it I wasn't sure I was qualified to talk about it but the more I thought about it the more I realized that 10 years is actually not a long enough window to capture everything of consequence that's happened. We need to look further back or over a 20 year period. Everything that we've seen in that 20 year period really has sown the seeds for the issues that we're seeing affecting our students and staff right at this moment. Issues like online teaching and learning and the student experience. If you've been a student or worked as a teacher any time in the last two or three years, you'll be all too aware of how chaotic education has become. It's precisely during these moments of instability that we should look backwards to see how it will inform the future of what happens next. This video focuses on teachers, how all of us have adapted for different teaching approaches and delivery modes, and more importantly, what we can learn from each of the seven phases of university teaching over the past two decades. Phase one, if it ain't broke, from 1990, but really much earlier than that, to early 2000. The lecture is the oldest tradition of university teaching that has stood the test of time. In the early 1990s, Classes were just chalk and talk and textbook readings. You had to be extraordinarily prepared as a teacher, walking in with nothing but your knowledge and memory of the order of topics and concepts, and of course, chalk and markers. Yes, this was difficult, but most of your work was front loaded. Once the class finished, that was it. No recording, no summaries, nothing. You rub up what you wrote on the blackboard or whiteboard and everything starts from scratch again next time. Sure, this wasn't that flexible for students who missed the class, but teachers weren't expected to help with that part of the experience. The expectation was that students need to be there to learn and teachers didn't really have to worry about putting on a good show. That actually sounds really good to me from a workload perspective. And I can see why some teachers think of this as the good old days or the golden age of teaching, but not many students these days can succeed in that type of learning environment. The lesson that teachers can learn from the old chalk and talk days though, is to be less reliant on audio visual cues or technology. The idea that we can be compelling just by ourselves, with our words and a bit of our writing, is a very powerful notion. We can all learn to be more effective communicators and sometimes going back to basics is the best way to learn, even for the most experienced teachers. We can spend our time honing our classroom delivery, how to make the topic interesting through your words and writing, perhaps making one class a week a fully unscripted open dialogue, no slides, no AV, just you talking to your students. Do you have the skills and knowledge to pull this together, to pull this off? That sounds like a really scary proposition, but it's when we're out of our comfort zones that we learn the most. Phase two, the tipping point. From roughly 2000 to 2005. Starting in the early 2000s, learning management systems like Moodle and Blackboard began to take off. There's now a place for teachers to put stuff online, and the default resource was PowerPoint slides. Everyone started using PowerPoint as the main way of communicating and there's a lot of advantages for the student. Less frantic note-taking, more focus on what the teacher is saying and promoting higher order thinking that accompanies genuine learning. But as a teacher, this is a huge time sink. Making PowerPoint slides look pretty takes a long time and I'm a scientist with no formal training in graphic or visual design. The temptation then is to load each slide full of text but then you're just reading off the slides. It's a bad experience for both you and your students. Keeping your slides detailed, but with room for abstraction and open-ended questions is somewhat of an art form. But in my experience, that's the best balance. Enough information to help guide your students' thinking, but not scripted to an inch of its life and giving your audience death by PowerPoint. I think more imagination is needed in how teachers can work with learning management systems. Instead of just using it to store PowerPoint slides and worksheets, what about pictures of hand-drawn diagrams, graphics and animations that you've made over the years trying to explain hard concepts in different ways? Small audio snippets of your musings on the topic or a video of you trying to work out a sample problem, whether you're successful or not. Be more creative and intentional with the multimedia resources we put online for our students is the direction the whole sector is moving in. 
And as individual teachers, we should be thinking about the skill sets we need to be effective in this space. Phase three, the revolution will be televised from 2005 to about 2010. Automated lecture recordings are the bane of many teachers' existence, certainly many of the ones I know. Will I be fact-checked by students if I say something wrong in the recording? Will they even come to class if everything is recorded? What once was a niche opt-in process has now become the default expectation. Automated lecture capture systems became in vogue just before 2010 and never really went away. Sure, we want students to attend classes live, because study after study shows that there is more productive and conducive learning environments to coming to class than watching things online. Automated lecture capture seems to disincentivize attendance, so naturally there is tension between students and teachers on this point all across the world. The challenge for teachers is to create learning experiences that are more compelling than automated lecture recordings of a computer screen and a static filled audio feed. What value do students get from actually coming to class? There are no easy answers here, and attending class will always come second to students working to pay their bills or fulfilling their family or carer duties. Sunshine is the best disinfectant, so I think opening a conversation with your students about attendance right at the start of the semester is a good approach. Missing classes and catching up by watching a lecture recording is perfectly fine as an exception, but not as the default rule for all of their learning. Can you make this visible to them right from the start of the semester. Provide authentic learning activities that rely on collaborating with other students, co-constructing shared knowledge with teachers through undergraduate research projects or work integrated learning opportunities or student as partners initiatives. There are more and more creative ways in this space to maximize student engagement both in and outside of class time. So you should pick a strategy that you're most comfortable with as a teacher and try it out. Phase four, MOOCs, MOOCs, MOOCs. From 2010 to 2015. MOOCs, or Massively Open Online Courses, started upscaling in their global reach in 2012, and that continues to this day. Every university or college is thinking about how to compete in this online space, and institutions with billions of dollars in endowments can afford to experiment with this at the highest levels. Ironically, the intended audience for MOOCs, students who have never studied or experienced higher education before, benefit the least from MOOCs. The high dropout rate for MOOCs has been well documented. It is, in fact, us teachers and other professional learners with one degree or qualification under our belt who have the skills and motivation to get the most out of MOOCs because we can propel our own independent learning. These early MOOCs have served as the prototype for how online learning is done today. Graphics, animations, videos, voiceover, a range of high quality multimedia resources that teachers typically don't know how to create by ourselves. The professional learning required in this space alongside with the rest of our job as academics or faculty members is really daunting. There is a lot of value though for teachers to learn something about multimedia creation. Yes, it could be as simple as drawing your own diagrams and not being at the mercy of textbook publishers updating their figures every single year, all the way to recording podcasts or videos tailored for your students to create that sense of an individualized learning experience. How should you go about learning these skills? Well, it just so happens to be another ripple effect of the MOOC movement. The internet is flooded with free online courses teaching you how to do everything especially in the creative industries. A quick YouTube search will show you how to use any of the programs that content creators rely on to animate, edit, and publish their work online. And these are all designed to be small, digestible chapters for you to work through at your own pace. So as teachers, we should take advantage of these free resources. Phase five, flipping the script from 2016 to 2020. I started hearing about flipped classrooms in 2015, and it seemed like a buzzword that just wouldn't go away. Looking back, it was inevitable that the push to make more MOOCs and online courses across the sector wouldn't bleed into the face-to-face -face classrooms that we teach every semester at some point. The idea of students doing pre-work before coming to class sounds fantastic in theory, but pragmatically speaking, it was never that likely to work. Students' lives are busy and more complex than ever before, so expecting them to do work after class is hard enough, let alone wanting them to commit to three hours of pre-study before attending a single lecture. Many of these problems stem from issues surrounding learning design. If you've been teaching for more than 10 to 15 years, odds are your learning experiences revolved around text. The current generation of students require more interactive media to absorb information, so text alone won't quite do it. How classrooms are flipped really matters. The pre-work we want students to do cannot be entirely text-based. Incorporating a range of multimedia to establish a presence as a teacher while they trawl through the resources you've curated 
and catalog just for them. If we cannot create our own original multimedia resource, students will feel more and more isolated as they work through learning materials that weren't designed specifically for them. It might be a daunting process, but think about creative ways you can incorporate multimedia as part of your professional learning. The lane I picked is video, and it took a long time to learn the skills needed and to set up this YouTube channel. But these skills are very transferable across different areas of my job. Research papers need video abstracts for journals to push out via social media. Funding bodies want short videos explaining the significance of your research to the general public. And more and more online conferences want you to have backup versions of your talk just in case the tech goes haywire on the day. If you find the right skill set to develop for your teaching, it can have a real synergistic impact across all the other domains of academic life. Basics, The Purge, 2020 to 2021. I'll level with you, I'll be honest, I'm very tired of talking and thinking about the pandemic and all of the implications that it's had or continues to have on teachers. We're all tired, tired of learning new buttons to press, new systems to navigate, all with very little notice. So there's not much more I can distill out of having to do all of our teaching online for two plus years that you don't already know as teachers who have lived through it just the same as me. The only thing I'll add is that the pastoral care that teachers in primary and secondary school have long done and been responsible for, looking after children as they develop into young adults. This responsibility has bled over into higher education as well. Giving lectures and designing classes is not enough anymore especially when students feel isolated, alone, depressed, anxious, and overwhelmed. University study is just one small part of most students' lives, and the more I try to learn about this, the more complex it seems. Learning about mental health first aid has been a really valuable part of my development, all the way from recognizing early signs of depression to how to talk to suicidal individuals. Being in isolation for two plus years has brought out the worst vulnerabilities from everyone, and I'm now much more aware of triggers for my own mental health, as well as how to manage students with chronic medical issues they need to consider alongside their study. Find the support mechanisms offered by your institution for students who are vulnerable and struggling, and make sure everyone in your class knows about them at the start of the semester. It's not up to individual teachers without more formal training to broach these sensitive topics with students, but at least you should know who to direct them to in your immediate context. Phase seven, no man's land. 2022 to the present. Now that the dust has settled, I'm constantly seeing pictures of empty lecture theaters and classrooms posted by teachers on Twitter. Yes, it would be great to go back to business as usual and in-person face-to-face classes only, but the genie is out of the bottle. I suspect we'll never go back to the way it was, but most of this is to clarify your expectations with students at the start of every semester. If there are some concepts or skills that are really hard to learn or absorb by yourself online, highlight this to the students, that this is a class that you need to attend in person. If on the flip side, there's information that's not a constant source of confusion, does it need to be taught live? Could it be a video that you make that frees up class time to tackle more difficult subject matter? If we design the delivery mode of each class with intent and specific alignment to course learning objectives, Students should be more receptive to that idea than just turn up to class or fail. That kind of messaging is unfortunately quite common. Universities are wrestling with how to future-proof our courses, so you should be as well as the teacher. We have to be nimble and adaptive now more than ever. And teachers should be talking with their immediate supervisors about how to plan out a multi-year professional learning strategy, all of which is designed to expand the scope of our teaching abilities and practices over time. I've been teaching at university for 12 years, and it's actually quite an exciting time. Scary, sure, but exciting to be a teacher. There's more to learn than ever before, especially as we look back on the past 20 years of university teaching modes. We can learn how to strip away the bells and whistles of AEV and tech and be more effective through our words alone, just like the chalk and talk days of phase one. We can think about more creative ways of populating our learning management systems, harkening back to when Moodle or Blackboard first launched and it still had all that potential for independent learning back in phase two. From automated lecture recordings and the race towards MOOCs in phases three and four, teachers should articulate the value of in-person learning experiences and manage student expectations around the effective use of online learning resources. We should also try taking an online course ourselves and see what the experience is like. See how disciplined you have to be to finish online training and relay these first-hand experiences to your students. You can relate and empathize with their situation even more. In phase five, designing flipped classrooms requires teachers to have a better handle on online multimedia creation. Find a type of multimedia you'd like to create and deep dive on how to make compelling online content beyond text 
Okay. Finally, from phases six and seven, teachers should be more aware of the context around student study and how everything around them can negatively impact on their, and by proxy, our experience. Everything in our sector is about to change all over again in the coming years, and we need to have the energy and understanding to tackle the challenges ahead as teachers. This is the Bylab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne. Hope to see you in the next video.